Hi, everybody. Welcome to Patent's AAC Spring talk, AAC Talks. This will be the second time today I said AAC Spring. Um, <laughs> welcome to Patent's AAC Talks Spring 2019 online web conference. You've just joined the session called Accessing AAC Competence Through the Lens of Activity and Engagement. So before we get started, I'll um, remind those of you attending live again that you're in listen-only mode, but you do have access to a question and answer. You'll see Q&A and chat screens in your um, Zoom window, and you can use either one of them to, to ask questions. Um, we will be monitoring the questions during the webinar, and um, we'll be sharing the questions with Karen for her to answer as time allows as we move through. The session is being recorded, and at the end of the live session, we'll, I'll give you the code for continuing ed. And at this point, you probably know where to look on the AAC Talks conference webpage, um, but you will see the link to it as conference page in your webinar chat. If you haven't opened that little chat icon, there also is a link to the session page where you can see Karen's hand, handout. So, as I say, we were joined as I. Um, didn't say yet, actually, we're joined today by Karen Kangas. Um, Karen has um, been a magnificent partner to us in assistive technology at Patton as we um, learn um, more and more about how to work with our students with the most complex bodies. So I'm going to turn things over to Karen. She can tell you a little bit more about what she, about herself and dive in to our content for today. So it's all yours, Karen. Thank you. Hello, everybody. I hope you're still awake and you've been, I know you've been hearing a lot of great information because I've been joining with the webinar too. All I really want to say about myself is again, I still continue to be an active clinician working with students with the most complex bodies as I have um, for the last 30 years uh, with assistive technology, 40 years beyond, before we started doing a lot with assistive technology. So I wanna spend this hour not about me, but instead about the students themselves. To start out with, uh, since I'm primarily known, or and one of the things I teach about the most is access, especially access for our students with complex bodies, um, everybody still hopes that what I'm going to talk about is actually the switches or eye gaze or why we're going to choose it. Instead, I really want to focus on what we're accessing. And I want to remind us all today that the two goals of education for all of us uh, to support our students are really creating opportunities for learning and preparing our students for life. And as we look at and always remember those, that's where I'm always coming back to when I want to look at issues of assistive technology. I want today to talk a great deal about task engagement because access to a communication device or a communication system or reading and writing can't happen if we don't have a student who's engaged. And I wanna talk about how we get at that task engagement. I wanna remind people that what has to happen is there has to be interest in the activity. Now, unlike many others, who people want to say, what is the child interested in? So we work with their interests. I really believe that in creating opportunities for learning, interest comes in that we provide activities they have not ever noticed or been a part of. That's what school is. It's preparing you, allowing you to have an opportunity to see things you haven't seen, think about things you haven't thought about, learn things you haven't learned. To do that, however, with with all students, we have to become in an active seating mode. That active seating means we have to have a bit more control of our body so that in fact we can ask it and our eyes particularly and our brains to match our eyes to have some visual focus. We have to be in an active seating mode, not a relaxed mode. That active seating, we're going to talk about a little bit more because it is one of the most critical pieces you need if you are looking for task engagement from any student. We expect visual convergence and some visual focus. Even if we have students who have cortical visual impairment, there is still a great deal we want to do in terms of helping them look and because that looking is a way we engage our central nervous system to also increase attention. I want us to also talk about and understand how the body affects the brain in terms of focus by understanding the ability to anticipate the beginning, middle, and end of an activity. 
So let's first talk about the, these issues we're going to talk about today and more involvement. One is the presumption of intention and competence. Seating for task performance, attention from intention, how the activity needs to come first, and then how we create those opportunities. So when we talk about a presumption of intention and a presumption of competence, this I have done from the beginning of time. And I used to think it was hard for me to teach anybody how to do this. I used to think it was kind of a gift from God that I happened to have it. But I want you to realize a few things. One, children are not small adults. So when you are working with students with complex bodies who are not mobile, who are not moving, and whose hands don't work, and who are not speaking, may have also medical problems, may be under the influence of a great deal of medication, may not sleep through the night, may have problems eating. They are having to wean their way through trying to pay attention in school. But needless to say, you still need to remember that they are not small adults. And so we cannot look at them as seeing them as a disability that we're going to fix or just position, and we're gonna to talk to them as if they were adults. And what I mean by that is we have to remember that they are developing. All children do grow and all children learn and all children develop as all human beings develop. The reason we may not see some of the dramatic changes we do in growth with all children in some children with complex bodies is their disability has actually interrupted that experience of development. We also need to recognize that when we are with these students, the most important thing that you must have with students with complex bodies is a relationship. You need to read their expressions and behaviors and tell them what you're reading. In other words, I don't look at somebody and say, you have to tell me yes or no by looking at a yes or no picture. When I'm with you, I begin to understand when you are agreeing or not by how your body is or by a facial expression. And I will tell you that. I saw you looked at me and smiled. I see that as you are liking what we're doing or I see we can go on. So the first thing I want you to do besides presuming that the person, the student has intention and therefore also has a presumption of developing competence, you need to become an incredible observer. I want you to observe them during activity and not in there looking for favorites in an activity, but in a new activity, I want you to observe them and see where they are understanding where that activity began, has its middle and has its end. And that means it's, it's important that you provide those clues to what that is. The only way that we actually can develop neuronal pathways, which is how our central nervous system's memory actually accommodates or puts in its memory systems, the learning is by us, our having the ability to recognize the beginning, middle, and end of an activity. Our ability to anticipate that then allows us to focus. It then allows us to call upon our body, what does it need for this particular activity? So the next thing we need to do is we then need to analyze the activities that we're doing with our students. And we need to analyze not just what is the work. You've had a lot of talk today about how you're analyzing vocabulary, you're analyzing um, how you are going to model behaviors, you're going to analyze uh, what your presentation materials are. I want you to do something now a little bit different. I want you to analyze what your actual body is doing, where your body is in relationship to the child's body and how it matches or doesn't match up with that child's body. And I want you to recognize that your presentation of the activity Activity. How you bring the activity to a child who's in a wheelchair is almost always coming at them. And I would like to shift that, that you come to the side. The reason being is when you are at the side of somebody and you are presenting it, you are able to help model your body with theirs. And that is relaxing to somebody. It doesn't feel like an attack. It doesn't feel like pressure of a test. And when you are sitting by someone beside them, you're also saying to them, we're on this journey together. It's not me telling you what to do. I've not taken an authoritarian position. I'm not judging you. Instead, we're going someplace together. 
Next, we want to talk about seeding for task performance. And the other word I could have put in there was also seeding for task engagement. Seeding for task engagement performance isn't a singular position. Um, and unfortunately, many of our students are in the same position all day. Let me, so let me spend just a few moments talking about that. Seating for postural management, which is the seating that children are in when they arrive in school, is the kind of seating that we provide for students who have complex bodies to keep them safe. We're hoping they'll be relaxed. It is actually the seating that they're using when they're transported to school. This seating is restraint. We are looking for restraint systems. Just as we wear our seat belts in a car, that's what we're looking for for these students. Um, it is symmetrical in nature. We have lots of strapping mechanisms. We have a headrest. We have trunk laterals. We have a seat belt. We have a, we have a pelvic belt. We have a chest harness. We have foot straps. We have arm straps. We may have even additional groin straps. We have a pommel. We have uh, we may have any other number of additional things that are keeping someone in their seat to get safely to school. That symmetrical posture without all of the strapping happens to also be a pretty good position when we're feeding someone because when someone is being fed, we, you need to be relaxed. So relaxation occurs when the body is in symmetry and is not expected to participate. So that is exactly the position we choose to, where we put our kids in when we put them in a car seat, because a car seat is not an active seat. A car seat is, again, a seat to get a child safely from one place to another while they are passively involved. Um, it is also something that we use when we want to relax. That's why we have lazy boys. That's what we talk about being a couch potato. And that's what our beds look like. So when we come in contact with a lot of surface, our body naturally gives into that, that surface to relax. It is a time that is saying, I'm not to engage in activity. I am instead to rest. Okay, this mode of processing is our tactile processing system. It is a time and that is and we've created systems for kids who have complex bodies because we believed that if in fact their body was relaxed, then they would be able to participate in life. That's actually not true. When their bodies are relaxed, it's no different than when yours and my body is relaxed. The fact of the matter is all we've done is relax. Instead, what we need to do is we need to provide seating for postural control. And this is the seating that children need for engagement. That means there needs to be some independent control of movement. There has to be pelvic stability, which is not pelvic stillness that is created by a strap, but is the ability for the pelvis to move. The pelvis houses our own individual center of gravity. And when that center of gravity moves forward with purpose, it automatically supports visual convergence and a natural focus. Um, we, it needs to be active, meaning that it has to be weight bearing. That means we have to call gravity up through our body, telling our body that we are moving with purpose. We don't move with purpose without gravity. These are our, this is our vestibular system. This is when the body needs to be active. This cannot happen when we are completely symmetrical because in order to be able to find gravity, we have to be able to use gravity to find gravity. Now, I know this sounds complicated and that's because it is, because we don't move in an a priori fashion, meaning A leads us to B. We are constantly moving internally, interstitially, and, and we are also then moving with our outside of our body. Even when we rest, we are moving. And many of our students have, have problems in the central nervous system that cause them to move even when they're trying to rest and moving involuntarily. That involuntary movement is not a part of the vestibular system. It is a part of where their hypervigilant resting system works. Now, I'm not expecting all of you to understand that, and I don't have a lot of time to go into it. I just want to give you again a conceptual frame of reference that what we are going to do as we are beginning to look at activity before we can look at access to a particular device, we need to recognize that we need to increase the range of our students seating for postural control. 
this description is basically what we're looking for. When I say the pelvis it was weight bearing, it means that if you would put your hand under the child's pelvis while they're sitting in their seat, you should not be able to get your hand under there easily because they should actually be pushing against the surface of the chair to help hold up their body. The head is in front of the shoulders and the body is upright. The body is slightly forward. Um, all parts of the body are not in contact with the surface of the seating. These positions need to be paired with activity. Another one that I didn't include in there is actually what's even more important is that feet are on the ground. And I will tell you that unfortunately, most of our wheelchairs and our kids come to school in seating that there is no way their feet ever get close to the floor. And is our feet on the floor that actually helps set up this seating, although kids are so amazing that even if their feet are not on the floor, um, they still can begin to move in some of these positions to have more access, which we're gonna talk about further. Okay, as we start to look at how do we assist students to move into some of these positions and create these positions, they need to be paired with activity and then that activity and that position experienced over time. This ability to com combine movement to an activity and the activity itself with an, with an anticipation of an understanding of that activity's beginning, middle, and end is actually what brings control of the body during activity. This definition of seating, I want you to really take into hand. Seating is not a particular position. It is a range of postures that are situationally specific, task defined and individually preferred. Right now, most of you are in front of your computer. Your computer is probably not on your lap. Um, if uh, Well, mine can't be because I'm actually using it. Some of you actually may have it on your lap because you could be thinking that you're relaxing. I hope you're not because if you're relaxing, you're not paying attention. Instead, I hope it's on a desk. And in fact, that desk, when, uh, when you come and sit to a desk to come to your computer, you already, by just the sitting at the desk, have told your body what is to be expected from it, how much power it needs, where the hands need to be placed, what the eyes have to do, because you have taught it that this, these positions pair with this activity. Now, the other difference is, is for OTs and PTs, all of you listening, it's also a treatment technique. That means I expect you to be on various levels of skill based on your understanding of how to support seating. And I hope that you will continue to learn it and develop stronger treatment techniques. Just as a reminder for all of you, teachers, parents, SLPs, OTs, PTs, everyone listening to this webinar, the more the body is in contact with the surface, the more it will give in to the surface. Obviously, we want students to be able to participate in activity. Hence, we need them to leave the surface. Attention from intention is another position that we need to understand from a neurophysiological point of view. Attention is not, I got your attention by calling your name and you looked at me. Attention is self-driven. Attention is self-focused. Attention is how endurance develops. And if you want to think about the height of intention it and attention, it is someone reading a book on their own. So we, I don't care if a kid pays attention to what's happening on the whiteboard in a group setting. I am concerned about how they attend to a particular activity. And if we are expecting children to become communication partners and they've got to use alternative ways to help them communicate, meaning using a dedicated device, somehow guide that partner, whether it's a low tech, which actually I prefer we would call it light tech, a light tech, a manual board, or a high tech situation. We have to recognize that that attention is driven from their own focus. So telling people or trying to co-opt children into saying that they are to be paying attention because you've made something so exciting is not as important as you being able to get them in a position of focus. As we alter our seating and move into weight bearing, natural attention is supported. 
so that we then can recognize that what we really want is we want a child's attention to stay longer and that attention has to be self-driven we're only going to get that from intention so in other words if i am interested in something then i will attend to it but that interest can't just come because something is funny or that I was entertained or I'm supposed to laugh. Instead, it has to come from my own personal interest in an activity. And I have to tell you, that's what the most exciting thing about working with children and anyone is about learning, is learning is about not someone finding out from you by a questionnaire what you're interested in, but by bringing you into a situation and activity that you yourself never before had anything to do with and find it's incredibly interesting and you want to be engaged longer. I'm hoping that's how all children feel about reading and about school. Okay, we want to talk about activity first. When I say activity first, I'm actually saying activity first before access. So being in quotes, the access expert, I know every time and I come to visit or work with a group of team who are struggling with a student with complex body, They're, they want to share with me what parts of the body they've tried and what kinds of switches they've used or eye gaze. And I always ask this first, what activity, what activity are you engaged in? Um, because before we can look at access, we have to look at the activity. And that activity, when you are dealing with a child who has not been able to move around and move to an activity of interest, they're not able to participate in the long hours of exciting manipulation of materials but have had extremely limited experience doing that, we have to recognize how vitally important the sharing in that activity is, how interest has to be there. And what I wanna say is, is that when we have kids who are not in wheelchairs, who aren't strapped in, who are definitely able to be mobile, and we have an activity, they tell us by so many ways whether they are interested in that, that activity or not. It isn't just by looking at it. They move towards it, they may wiggle around, they may, they may actually try and grow, grab a part of the activity, they may try and grab you for an activity. Uh, much like your toddlers do uh, at home when, you, when they themselves are still don't have the greatest language but they're trying to get a point across children with complex bodies who don't have that large repertoire to beat us over the head to tell us they're interested do still let us know but they may only have one signal or two instead of the usual 100. that's why it's so important that we observe them carefully as we invite them involved into an activity this activity first is one that I like to talk about that we need to create. It's the sharing of a new idea, of new information. It's not simply just recording favorite people or places or activities and listing them or putting them on a manual board or communication device for them to locate. Instead, it's about the things that we wouldn't expect to be there. It's about the words that don't develop a picture. It is about those verbs, but it's not about verbs in the air or verbs they even understand. It's verbs that somehow have something to do with an incredibly important activity. This learning is actually what's required from the most teaching. And I want to say that I'm sorry to say that many, much of the observation that I see on a regular basis with kids with complex bodies is testing rather than teaching. Because we're so curious about feedback, because all of us feel the pressure that children are supposed to perform and we're supposed to demand looking at task engagement, we frequently look at a motor act and the counting of it as being an, ob an obvious reaction to something we've presented. Hence, we talk about someone hitting a switch at eight out of 10 times, as opposed to us talking about whether or not they understand the vocabulary. Um, the webinar right before this that was done by the two um, speech therapists from Saltillo were talking about how long it actually takes for you to model with an AAC device, a particular word, 
how long it takes for a student then to be able to use it themselves. And I think they said it was over 150 trials, um, which gives you an idea that we can't be then waiting for those 150 trials to consider something an opportunity. I want us to make sure we have very rich teaching. And that's why I was so excited to be involved with Project Max, where we really began to say, we want to look at the teaching that's happening to children of the same age. And from that, we want to be able to set up activities in which our children can participate. And this is where I want us to look. I want children in assistive technology to be a part of every activity, of every part of the day, and I want us to look at how we can begin to do that. When we want to look at activity, the most important thing we need to do is identify the beginning, middle, and end of activity. The beginning is a clue of, are you ready? It's time to come over here. We are going to read a book together. And when we bring some over to read a book together, unfortunately, with, it, with children with complex bodies, most of the time we don't bring them to where the book is, we bring the book to them. Instead of recognizing a classroom where we have reading groups, where we have reading corners, where we have reading setups, where we have little uh, learning centers, where when the child goes to that center, they immediately know what's going to happen at that center, what the contextual value is. Consequently, they know what they're expected of their body. We don't do that. We have classrooms where instead we're bringing something to a child. We place it in front of them again, super passive, setting up a situation. So where does the beginning of the activity happen? When you approach the child? Instead, the child needs to approach the activity. So we need to ensure that an activity is set up at a table or a spot or a corner or some place that we literally transport the child to. We bring them to the activity. The activity needs to have a signal of its beginning. Then we need to get into the middle of the activity, which might be the shared reading, and we need to know when it ends. Now, that's not the end of the book. Instead, what it needs to be is we need to recognize that that middle the beginning, middle, and end, since our children have very little experience with beginning, middle, and end, we need to set up our activities to have some little short reference points. So instead of reading the whole book and thinking the end of the activity is the end of the book, I would like us to think about looking at one page when we're going to read that story and we're going to bring the child forward to the book because as the body moves towards something, it automatically actively says, I want to hold myself. I'm looking to be focused to that activity. I need to pay more attention. And then we can actually let the body relax at the end of that page and we can repeat what just happened. So we can say, we just read Billy Grote Gruff and we read the first page. And we can say, now let's, I wonder what's gonna happen next and we can reassert the child in a position of readiness, read the next page, and then allow another relaxation. This little, these little short stints of changing position are setting up the body to say, this is what, how I pay attention. This is how I'm going to begin to know what I'm supposed to do. So if we do not change the physical configurations or the student seating, the teacher's position, or the physical configuration of the activity itself, we will never pair nor will we get these neuronal pathways that will support being ready for an activity. We will also not develop extended attention, nor will we develop what we like to call as therapists any kind of endurance, whether it is cognitive endurance or physical endurance. Let's already start looking at some examples of this. First, I just want to show you some cute babies. Now, when we see babies here, I don't think there's any doubt that they're relaxed. And you can see, even so they're in harnesses, the harnesses don't hold them so well. And if we look at them continue to sleep, look at the symmetry that occurs. See, they're joined together at the hip. One is calling the other one over. Look how easily their bodies seem to look at each other. Their, head, their heads are not under their control. Their legs are not under their control. Their hips are in external rotation. Their trunks are collapsed. But not any one of us is saying, oh, let's go get a story. They're ready to read a book. 
we know that these are sleeping babies and that these positions are relaxed, okay? So if we recognize that often our students are seen to be in this position when we go to look at them, and that's because they have either had a long bus ride, um, they're falling out of the straps there, or they're actually attempting to move to change position, but we have so many restraints, they can't get any place. Let's look at some of those students. First of all, I'm a big advocate of looking at the head first for access. And the reason I want to is because the head is the first extremity that demonstrates control from pelvic weight bearing. Uh, I want to show you this is a student that I met 31 years ago. And what happened is we were looking at access. The team thought that maybe she, her knee would be best at hitting a switch under a tray with a communication device on top of her tray. Um, I, at this time, was working at Hershey Medical Center. She was in an, the, being seen by the orthotist to get new um, leg braces. And I was delivering a power chair that a, to another kid who was not taking it home because it was going to be going to his school since he lived in an apartment. She was so excited at looking at that, at that chair that I told her that I would be happy to put her in that chair, but that we were instead going to have to get her legs underneath her, and she was going to have to be able to keep them quiet and to be able to use her head because that's how the chair drove. Now, her mother right away told me, as did her physical therapist who was visiting with, with them, that she would never keep her legs quiet. At this time, this was 30 years ago. I'm not going to tell you that I did do a little leg strapping here. Uh, this, isn't, this is not more of a restraint. It was a system I was doing to get some more proprioceptive input to the pelvis. Um, I no longer do this. She did have a 90 degree seat belt on, but her feet were underneath her. And what I really want to show you is the difference of this is how she came in. I was told she had no head control. That's why we had to look at the leg. That was the only thing that she could voluntarily move out of the system. And she purposely pulled them out of the foot straps all the time. And I want to show you this was 20 minutes later and she not only was she able to hit these use these mechanical switches to drive she could use all three of them but she clearly had head control you can see that she is not touching the back surface with her trunk her legs are clearly I've tried to make them feel like they were on the floor that we've lifted up her knees are lower than her pelvis, so she can still get some independent rotation. But most importantly, what I wanted you to see is I wanted you to see how that head can be. So we can go from someone who we think has no head control to not recognizing that they could as we move them from a system where their entire body is in contact with the surface, we're moving them to a system where they don't have to have contact with the surface. These two trunk laterals, by the way, are not touching her, although they are looking at their next to her sweatshirt. They're just nearby uh, so that she doesn't feel like she, she, so I provided a frame for within which she could move. Let's look at now today when we have the ability to use electronic switches. Uh, I'm really, I, I'm a big advocate of using electronic switches because they require zero force. Uh, when we're dealing with a mechanical switch, it really requires graded movement to manage a mechanical switch. And that means you have to first locate it, usually visually, then you have to touch it, then you have to press it, then you have to hold it, then you have to release it. How long you hold it in that fourth action is based on what the activity is. If you're using it on, in a single uh, switch uh, with a scanning array on a communication device, that hold is short. Uh, but if you're using it to drive a power chair, that hold is long. But the fact of the matter is that hold is not a press, it's a hold and then a release. And inevitably, children who have tone or who have complex bodies don't have that graded movement. So they use a lot of adrenaline and willpower to throw whatever extremity they're using at the switch. Hence, we actually call it hitting the switch. They actually have to hit it, but they aren't hitting it. They're going right to hold. So they're jumping past location, touch, press to hold, and then they can't release it. And their inability to hold and release it makes it a constant problem for us to be able to get through a scanning array. We then make the scanning array small or we slow it down. And then we, from that motor problem, we then prevent them from having access to a lot of vocabulary. 
Instead, if we're using an electronic sensor, an electronic sensor is a zero pressure switch. It does not require any pressure. Its location is its activation. You don't touch, press, or hold. You just need to move near it and it is activated and released. I want you to meet Desiree, and I just want to show you in these two pictures that she was being expected to hit this mechanical switch with her wrist, and she only has five degrees of active shoulder extension. She has a scoliosis, she has hip flexion contractures, this hip is actually completely subluxed and dislocated, this one is partially subluxed. She has knee flexion contractures, ankle flexion contractures. She just got out of the hospital. She went in for pneumonia. She ended up catching one of those dread uh, additional diseases, um, was, had to be ventilated, was in instead of for a few weeks, was in for several months. This is the second day she's at school um, after she's come out of the hospital. And what the team really wanted me to be able to do is not only help them stabilize this arm so as she hit the switch it could stay more stable, but they wanted to know could we mount the communication device high so that her eyes could see it from this position. Instead, what I want to point out to you is that I instead wanted to look at, again, getting her into pelvic weight bearing. I wanted to attend to the fact that she already had a dislocated hip and a rotated pelvis and place her to see if, in fact, she had head control. So in this position, I actually had a powered chair there where I can have the electronic sensors in a head rest because it's very obvious what when someone touches a switch, what happens. So I don't have to worry about whether or not it's going to manage or communication device. Uh, I'm not going to tell you I did this in five minutes. This was a process, but I wanted to show you it still was within one session. It took me about a half an hour to get her here. And she was able to drive the chair because her, the sensors are located within this head array. We were then able to take this same head array, go get her communication device, put her communication device into two switch scanning modes, so no timing, demonstrate to her that one was the switch that was going through the array and one was the selector. She immediately managed and navigated through her entire device, which at that time had 40 pages. The people working with her were astounded that she knew it, but they were even more astounded that they had that many pages and how they hadn't really looked carefully at the navigation strategy. The point I'm trying to make is how seating and understanding its pairing and where the body is and how it functions is extremely important to the activity. So it wasn't that I changed to electronic sensors. I changed everything. I changed moving her out and putting to her body into a position that supported her own ability to be upright. She was able to demonstrate head control. Her eyes came down and were able to better focus. Um, you can see we didn't change much position in her arms. And I, I want you to realize we were expecting too much for her to be able to use her hands with only five degrees of shoulder extension to try and hit a switch. So going from this to here, but this isn't the end. This doesn't mean now we're stopped. This means this is actually our beginning. So we spent a lot of time here because this is what she looks like going on and off the bus. There's nothing wrong with that. We need that. But we don't, we can't use this position for when we want to be in school. So my next challenge with this team was, how do we get this position in this chair? And in reality, in some cases, we can't do that. We have to look at a chair that we're gonna sit at in school, and we're gonna go back and forth in this chair. And in other cases, we are able to make the change. We may be able to alter this seating temporarily for her to be able to move into this position so she still could go back here. Understanding then that body and student control that's gonna set up for activity, I wanna point out again Juliana. Now Juliana is 19 and actually her feet are almost underneath her body. Um, everybody believes that she only has limited head control. And the reason they thought so is they believed her chair was actually in a 90-90 position and she just on purpose didn't put her head in the headrest. Now I don't know why we think that somebody's doing something wrong instead of us observing and saying why? Why is she bringing her head up there? And what we actually, you're gonna find out in a minute when I show you how we, I look at that process is you're gonna find out that Juliana, as most kids, their bodies are doing the right thing. 
not their, and they, it, it does not match what the seating was developed for. So this seating that she's in was developed to get her safely back and forth on the bus. I want to have her in a more active position, and that's actually placing her in a regular chair at a desk, which was quite surprising to her family and to the staff here, and to her. You can see she was equally surprised. All right, how do we go about doing that? Well, at first, I wanted to just take off the straps in her system to see, was I able to, if I took off the leg rest and moved her forward, could I move her away from the back she was used to, and would she be able to demonstrate some control of her body? And in this position, uh, I, wanted, I did not want her to feel that I was testing her. So I am very lightly holding onto her head as I move her body very slowly forward. Now, I'm not the activity, so I can't move her at first towards the activity. I'm just trying to figure out her body. I took off the leg rest because I want to see what's going to happen with her legs. Do her feet touch the floor? Do they come forward? Can I get pelvic weight bearing? That's the whole point of what I'm looking at. And do I see a demonstration of some visual focus? Okay. As we started to move her forward, I quickly then began to see that her, her seat was in fact not at 90-90, it was angled back, and the reason she was placing her head here was because when she was back in the headrest, she was reclined. She was lodging her head here forward, and because she had a chest harness on, she couldn't get any more forward, and she was just resting against this outside pad because that was allowing her head to be slightly forward. So then when I placed her on a chair, I purposely did not place her in a chair in a symmetrical posture because I'm looking for weight bearing. I placed her on the corner of the chair so I could support some rotation in the body. She has some limited rotation there because, because we don't just sit in a chair and move forward. We actually sit in a chair, we hold our pelvis and our trunk and shoulder girdle slightly rotate to then set up our head to have the most power of visual focus. And that's where we moved here. Okay. If we want to look at how we deal with access now, I want you to recognize that we're going to pair access to activity, not pair it, but not just give it to a child. So this is Emily, and Emily was either a noodle, okay, so she'd either be collapsed or she would be in such extension it would be fierce. Um, so this is Emily. We were actually trying a new um, uh, high-low seat. I love high-low chairs for everybody because I like feet on the floor. Um, and also, I love using a hands-free walker. This is the kid walk as a seating system in an activity. Now, you can see I don't have any switches around. What we need to do is first, I want to be engaged in an activity. So we're gonna, we actually were going to read a story, and I also had some puppets there. And I wanted to see Emily's engagement in activity. How did her body go as we were engaged in activity? Because we're going to not only be involved in this activity, we're going to then add assistive technology and access to this activity as we've sorted out the seating and focus in the activity. Okay, I did introduce uh, first an electronic sensor to Emily at home with her mom. And what happened is, is they were, and the mom with, had control of an electronic sensor, and she, I did tell her that I, and I did talk to Emily about it, I wanted her to try it at her head, but she could also try it with her hand. Her mom could move it down by her hand. In this case, what we're looking at is we're introducing this, but her mom said she really, really loved some software programs that had to do with math and reading, and she, and she also liked to do dress-up dolls, and she had a particular software program that could dress up dolls. So this is the mom is the switch mount. She's moving it wherever it has to happen. Mom can also manage the switch um, because what we're doing is we're just pairing. This is how this switch works in the activity we were using it and we want Emily to be able to manage her body. Over time, we were able to set up that she could be in a high-low chair, and we could actually, this now, the same sensors that I talked about, that you saw earlier that drive a chair, the sensors are just in, this is just a, um, a head headrest. And what we have in here is, these, this was being able to manage, the, again, the computer, so she could have two switch access to a computer activity. Okay, I just wanted to show you Emily, as we started working with seating, finally got on her horse. She now is a big horseback rider, and I just wanted to show you that. I wanted to show you then Emily, that as we started out in her chair, we were able to, when we once we figured out her seating to be a bit more adequate, she could work some from her chair, but I want you to see that her head doesn't always sit in the, in the midline. We figured out that she had some visual processing problems. We were able to help figure that out, and all of this is taking about 18 months. 
You can see that she could be in her hands-free walker to, to walk and move around, but I also use that and like to use that as a seat within the classroom. Okay, this is Emily now two years later. Now in those two years, we were also working on manual boards with vocabulary, developing vocabulary. When I say we, I had very little to do with it except its support. Her mom and her speech therapist did all of this so that when we actually had figured out that she could pay attention, that she could look at stuff, so they're already looking, at, she had a lot of vocabulary, then we were able to try a Toby device and all of that was in there already was the vocabulary that she knew, which she knew a lot. And because she now knew how to get her body ready, she could be able to use this device. Where to start? The most important thing is to get out of chair instruction. This is a perfectly appropriate chair position for a child who's resting. However, again, when this student, when, uh, when I was told the student didn't have head control, we can't worry, we, we're not sure he can use head switches, his hands don't always work, we're not sure how he's visually paying attention, then the best thing that we can do, and this is where we really need the therapists, OTs and PTs need to do this first, but we, again, we, can, we have to figure out how to get your body in a position of weight bearing, and that means out of your chair. The easiest way to know that your body is gonna be involved in a new activity is to not be in the same position in the same chair that you were resting in. So as soon as you're out of that, here we are and being able to start to begin to read a story, okay, out of chair. And I will tell you the best seat for someone that you don't have a seat yet figured out for is a person. Um, and I know that, that I'm not expecting everybody to do that, and I'm not expecting a teacher to do that. I'm expecting this to be a therapist. This happens to be a teacher who is very comfortable doing this. And you, most of you are looking at Susan Gill. Yep, we were worked together on this case. But the, where we're gonna start is I want the kid out of that chair before we... However, we might be able to change the chair they're in. Okay, so we may be able to bring the child in the chair that they're in forward by adding some um, rolls, some towel rolls to be more forward, to not have their back touching the back and not be able to have their head in the headrest. Because what happened here is, is that as the student would attempt to be able to manage these switches, you're asking him to try and bang his head because again, he's in this very relaxed mode. So when we want to move an extremity, we have to find gravity. Gravity speaks through our center of gravity, which is in our pelvis, and then has to speak to the shoulder girdle and the pelvis has to speak to the head. The, the shoulders don't tell the head where to go, the pelvis does. For this student, the for him to press up to get his head to roll to work, he'd have to push on his foot plates, almost push his butt up, and because his shoulders were back, it would force him to slide out of the chair. So he could, couldn't get very many switch hits. When instead, if we can bring him forward, we then are gonna look at how do we present the switch here? But I'm not just gonna bring him forward and put the switch next to his head. I wanna bring him forward and engage him in activity of interest and then we will add the switch. So when we're creating opportunities for learning, I want us to remember that just being able to hold a pencil doesn't teach how to write. Being able to point to a picture with your finger doesn't teach you how to read. And access to a single switch to a switch toy isn't play. Activity is literacy, communication, socialization, language development, functional independence, developing schedules, journals, writing, thinking, sharing dreams, playing with others, making something concrete, printing, drawing, taking selfies, managing an AAC device, taking photos. Those are where the richness lies. And our children need experience with that not by us bringing it towards them and to them in the only position they can be in, but by instead recognizing we need to provide them with the ability to be in some different positions as well. We need experience, experience, experience with activity that we then bring 
access to by using it with the child. And this combination of working with an activity and knowing its beginning, middle, and end, preparing the body intentionally to be ready to be engaged in activity, to anticipate what's about to occur, to extend the visual and auditory focus, will then allow us to practice with access. A child does not know how to immediately create color within the lines. And their ability to color within the lines does not have anything to do with teaching them to read per se. It means that when a child can in fact bring a focus to an activity that includes their body, that's how they actually can extend attention. This is true of every child. The biggest challenge for students who are not leaning AAC, I just see that as leaning, <laughs> but are learning AAC and the use of an AAC device is a lack of experience with the machine itself, its software and its navigation strategies. So not only do we have to help encourage children to communicate, to develop a partnering skills. We also need to teach how the machine works, how its software works, how its navigation is used. And as access is a part of this activity, it will grow and it will develop as task engagement with the activity grows. I can't emphasize this enough. I know I'm asking you to somewhat believe me, but I'm here to tell you the old idea of just starting with dead end cause and effect software to teach access with a switch, thinking that someone's gonna turn it on and off will not help them use it in being able to make one novel comment. Instead, the way we learn to manage an activity is being a part of an activity. AAC devices aren't just a voice. They're machines and they contain software that require navigation. They have vocabulary that is predetermined with the exception of the software MinSpeak. And it has to be taught. For them to be communicative, there's a lot of activity and teaching that has to be done cooperatively and access will in fact become more competent. Access is a part of the activity and it will grow and develop as a task engagement with activity grows. I actually am done early. This is so unbelievable, I can't tell you. So I don't know if we have some questions. I have no problem going back and talking a little bit more about some of the issues here. Um, or I don't know if we need to just be done, like to say class is early and you've been sitting all day. Susan, what should we do? Do we have any questions? Um, there are not questions, but, um, and I understand completely why. This, uh, thank you, Karen. I'm going to share with you a comment that came in on the question um, on the Q&A board, and it says, it's from Kelly. Kelly says, no question, but you're inspiring and motivating to really explore posture for function and not to accept that current placement is correct just because that's what was decided by a team. Excellent advocate for these kids. Um, so I wanted to share that. A question has come in while well, I've been telling you that one. Um, here's a question from Alicia. Is there any way to access some of the before after pictures from your presentation? I'd like to show the PTs, OTs on my teams. Well, um, I did, um, the, the pictures that I'm using here, uh, the webinar is gonna be archived. Um, I cannot uh, give you those themselves. The families that I work with give me permission to share them, but I do have permission for them to remain in this webinar. So if the webinar is going to be archived, you may be able to change that. Susan, can you answer that? Um, once the webinar is archived, um, certainly, you know, right. people, can, you can, pe you, people can't take those pictures and wow. use them in, um, right. in, and share them in other in. Right. Into other materials and webinars, but they can certainly share them. So in other words, you're going to have to force your team to listen to me. <laughs> or at least look. 
here. Here's a screenshot. I'm going to talk to you about it. Okay. Another comment is, this, this is thought provoking. And as a teacher, I realize how much I need my OT and PT to become engaged in this. There is so much to know, um, but I feel like I can do some of this. Um, what a great comment about um, the importance of engaging the therapists in this. Um, you know, this isn't the work of uh, teachers alone. Uh, you want to comment on that, Karen? Yes, I do. And I want to say, you know, just like um, uh, teachers I, and teachers and speech therapists, I, I don't want you going back and grabbing kids' bodies because, again, when we kind of officially look at it, it is the PTs and OTs. But PTs and OTs haven't really, all of them aren't themselves recognizing how important it is that they are a part of activity. Um, and so we're all learning just like speech therapists and teachers are learning about augmentative OTs and PTs. Uh, OTs have a bit more training in looking at activity because that's a part of what we do, whereas PTs have not. They are looking at postural patterns and they've been asked to look at them in isolation. So bringing those OTs into looking at activity is something I feel uh, my passion is to help all of them better understand how we want to look at the supports we're using in school it can not only help the body and expand its repertoire of movement and control, but can it literally increase task engagement. Okay, thanks, Karen. I have, there's another, I think we'll take this one last question. Um, it probably applies to a lot of people. Uh, Melissa is asking this question in a school setting. How do you incorporate this positioning in the IEP paperwork and any tips on getting buy-in from all team members despite the extra time and effort needed to adjust positioning? I think that's a loaded question. And I think that, the, that um, uh, putting things in IEPs is, uh, oh, that's very individual, but the team buy-in um, uh, question, I know you've tackled that um, both with success and not. You wanna comment, Karen? Well, the, I think the team buy-in is no different than anything else. If your team is struggling really because of their learning together, there can always be those kind of struggles. And that's what uh, I'm hoping, hoping to support in terms of our understanding of seating and engagement. And when you, it's, it's not, in, uh, getting a team buy-in is no different than than the team, than all we've been talking about with augmentative. I mean, when we talk about modeling and that every adult in the environment needs to be modeling the use of an AAC device, uh, it's no different than us understanding body postures. And um, unfortunately, when kids with the most complex bodies first came to school, I mean, and this is, we're talking about in the, you know, early 70s, um, and then on to the 80s, you know, a lot of the equipment that we have laying around is old. And we did static posturing at that time. That's 30 years old information, that static posturing. So that was the standing frames. That was a side liar. Um, that was just a straight chair. And so it's no different that when we start looking at how important activity is, that we recognize we've got to change some positions. I am here to tell you that you are already involved in changing positions. The trouble is all of your time though is in changing the position of the switch because the kid can't reach it. And if we look at any point in time when I'm involved in a classroom of kids with or with a student with complex body, there's already a lot of repositioning. Um, so I'm not, and all I can tell you is, is if we instead look at carefully um, how the student can in fact experience situations, it's only hard in the beginning. It really does get easier because the child actually develops more control and belief in themselves. That is very, very true. So it's only really hard in the beginning because then when I'm working, I will find simpler ways for you to make simple changes, but that are huge in terms of being able to make that difference. But in the very beginning, it's tough, yes. But, it, but you're not gonna get the benefits if we don't start. I hope that helped. Well, I hope so too. I think that we are probably um, out of time, um, sadly, but I wanna thank Karen once again for uh, this wonderful information. Uh, you have some contact information on this slide. Um, and I think that because this is one of the two sessions that closes our um, AAC talks, 
um, web conference, um, I just want to point out what a fitting one it is, although it's, um, we've been talking about communication, vocabulary, um, uh, partner behavior, high expectations all day long that you can mind, certainly take some of Karen's ideas and go back and all the way to our keynote and mine some of the suggestions for um, ways to support teams as they, as they learn. Um, I did just want to say, if anybody has a pressing question or it comes later, please tell them that that's why you have my email address there. I don't mind. Just let me know that you, you, uh, that came from the webinar that you have a question. Okay. Cause I, I see it for you to do that. In. Um, and, um, so anyway, I am going to provide, uh, people with the code, uh, your, uh, act 48 code is five, eight, two, six, five, eight, two, six. I also put it into the, um, chat window. Um, I'll say it again, five, eight, two, six, while I say thank you and goodbye to Karen. And thank you all of you for your uh, attention and participation today um, on our first run. And we know that there were a few technical difficulties and um, we will deal with them, but we really appreciate everyone's interest and attendance. So thank you, Karen. Thanks everyone else. Thank you. Bye-bye.